Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for taking time out of your Thursday evening to attend this webinar on uh, the US-led new Cold War against China. Uh, my name is Chris Marion. Uh, I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation here in New Hampshire and uh, also a member of the New Hampshire Peace Action Board. A uh, little info about us. Um, PSL is a uh, grassroots revolutionary socialist organization uh, engaged in many working class struggles here in the heart of global imperialism. Uh, recently organizing rallies in solidarity with Palestine and against evictions of uh, houseless folks in Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, Peace Action is uh, also a grassroots organization focusing on anti-war efforts uh, by educating, organizing and mobilizing people across New Hampshire uh, to stand for a more peaceful and just world. Um, and uh, if you'd like to find out more about these organizations, uh, you can find uh, PSL at, uh, or the Southern New Hampshire branch of the PSL on Facebook uh, at SNHPSL. And uh, if you're interested in joining a revolutionary political party, uh, you can visit us at pslweb.org slash join. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out more about uh, Peace Action, you can find us at Peace, uh, or sorry, NH Peace Action on Facebook and uh, check us out at nhpeaceaction.org. And if you'd like to get information from us and join us, uh, you can sign up for our email list by clicking the Act tab from the homepage. Uh, and before we get started, just in the spirit of understanding and respect, we'd like to acknowledge that we are doing our work here in New Hampshire on the traditional uh, ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, uh, past and present. And we want to honor with gratitude the land and the waterways uh, that they have been stewarding throughout the generations. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, let's introduce our speakers. Um, we're very lucky to be joined by one of the most important uh, and outspoken journalists uh, working today on anti-imperialist issues uh, in the U.S., uh, Danny Haifong. Uh, Danny is a contributing editor of the Black Agenda Report and co-host of The Left Lens and an organizer with New Cold, or sorry, No Cold War. Um, he is a co-author of American Exceptionalism and American Innocence. Uh, People's History of Fake News from Revolutionary War uh, to the War on Terror, and maintains his own blog at uh, patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. And, uh, oh, actually, it looks like Ben is here as well. Sorry, uh, Ben Norton, thank you so much for, uh, um, yeah, for joining us. Uh, ben Norton is uh, another fantastic journalist. Uh, he is a, also a filmmaker who's reported from a number of different countries, and uh, he's the assistant editor of the independent news website, uh, The Gray Zone. Uh, so thank you so much, both of you, for uh, for joining. Uh, so I'd like to start actually with uh, with Danny first. Uh, if you can give us just a little bit more information on your background, how you uh, became interested in journalism and involved in journalism, and uh, where folks can find your work. Oh, okay. Well, that's a very big question. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, thanks uh, to the Southern New Hampshire PSL and New Hampshire Peace Action. I really appreciate the invite. So in terms of how I got interested in journalism, I, I came out of college, you know, in the midst of this anti-racist struggle that was happening here in the United States. It was post Trayvon Martin then leading into Black Lives Matter. And the Obama administration was wholly disappointing. I mean, I, I've grown up in Boston and New York City, and these are very liberal places, liberal bastions, so to speak. And Obama mania was the order of the day for so many people, even those on the radical left had a hard time criticizing Barack Obama. And once Obama went through with the invasion of Libya and uh, repressed, brutally repressed the Occupy Wall Street movement as well, uh, I knew I needed to figure something out apart from the Democratic Party. And ever since, I have been writing for Black Agenda Report since 2013, and uh, you know that outlet was just is just a political home for me. I mean, it is one of the few on the left that's willing to talk about anti-imperialism, that's willing to challenge racism, and so I've I've been doing that as much as I can for the last eight years. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, yeah, same question to you, Ben. Uh, if you just want to give us a little bit more. Uh information on your background, uh, you know, how you got involved in journalism, where folks can find your work. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for organizing this event. And Danny Haifong is a friend and comrade, so I'm glad to be speaking with him as well. 
I joined journalism, you know, through a very similar trajectory. I became a journalist after being a student activist and and realizing that, you know, a lot of activism and a lot of organizing is built around trying to get media attention, trying to challenge media narratives. And just reading and analyzing and studying the media, just recognizing how much of it really is based on lies and distortions and half-truths, something we'll be talking about a lot today. And seeing the importance of creating new independent media, fighting back against those mainstream corporate media narratives, that disinformation, that propaganda. And I've been involved in lefty media the past several years, about a decade now. And I write, I'm a, the assistant editor of The Gray Zone. I work with the founder and editor, Max Blumenthal, and a small team of a few other journalists. And we are dedicated, it's a small news website dedicated to challenging corporate media propaganda and doing original investigative journalism on imperialism, showing what the US empire is doing around the world. And especially increasingly, as we struggle against the, the new Cold War, something we'll be talking about today, just exposing the distortions and the lies behind the new Cold War. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, and just a quick note before we jump into the uh, main discussion here, uh, we do have a good amount of time uh, set uh, set aside at the end for Q&A, uh, so, and we'd love to hear from everybody. Um, so if you do have questions for our speakers throughout the talk, uh, just drop them in the chat and uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, so I'd like to, to jump back to, uh, to Danny here uh, and have you discuss your, your recent trip to, to China. Uh, so recently you spent uh, about two weeks, I believe it was, with the, uh, the Silk Road delegation uh, traveling throughout China. And uh, the story, the piece that you submitted to the Black Agenda Report paints a very different uh, picture than what we're typically uh, given here in the U.S. I mean, we're typically told that China is very poor. Uh, you know, backwards country that has, you know, deals with a lot of pollution. Uh, you know, the Xi Jinping is just this authoritarian dictator. Um, so if you can uh, just walk us through your experiences and, uh, yeah, just parse through some of that for us. Sure. Well, it, it was, it, it's a very interesting trip for me. I mean, it was, it was very eye-opening because once I came back, China was really starting to uh, come under the throes of this virus that eventually became the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, I was there late December 2019, the day after Christmas, I think I got there and I came back in mid-January, I think it was January 11th, I got back. And so I was able to travel from Beijing all the way west to Urumqi, which is considered the capital of Xinjiang. And I traveled with a group of very, a very diverse political spectrum of folks. Cynthia McKinney was on the trip. Uh, Lee Su Hin was the organizer of the China US Solidarity Committee. And the purpose was to really experience China um, as uh, not necessarily investigative journalists. We weren't there to poke and prod, right? We didn't feel like that was our place, but our place was to really observe uh, what was the reality of the situation and talk to people um, as equals. And so we went, you know, originally Beijing and the last city was in Arumchi. And I think the thing that struck me the most was, you know, we hear all the time poverty alleviation, or at least we should be hearing all the time that China has eliminated extreme poverty and that poverty has been alleviated significantly, especially over the last 40 years. But to see it was was incredible. Uh, the cities in China are, are very highly developed. When they say that there is, when the media says that there is this new middle class, right? Really what they're talking about is just workers with more money. And uh, you could see how disposable income and the fact that the state has control over the commanding heights of the economy and keeps prices very low. I mean, I took a cab in Arumchi, I think uh, for the first 10 kilometers, it's uh, three RMB, which is like 50 cents, uh, you know, something like that, 45, 50 cents. So, you know, that, that standard of living that's being built 
uh, and that is increasing is a very real thing. And the commitment to renewable energy was also just uh, very fascinating to see. We went to a solar farm outside of Dan Huang, which is a desert oasis, very small city, uh, where there were uh, over a thousand miles of uh, solar panels, right? Just uh, solar farms, they call it. And uh, people in the United States say, oh, well, that exists somewhat in California, but in China, it's, it's kind of a normal thing for the entire country to be committed in a very planned way to renewable energy. So whether you were in rural areas or whether you were in the cities, uh, that commitment is very easy to see. I got to travel on two high-speed rail trains and travel the distance of 500, 600, 700 kilometers in a matter of a few hours, which was an incredible experience given how you go on the Amtrak in the United States and the same trip from, I don't know, Boston to DC or New York City to, uh, you know, to Detroit, Michigan, you're spending 12 hours, 14 hours on the train to get uh, the same distance. And so those commitments to infrastructure, to renewable energy, and the fact that although China is often painted as this kind of mecca of capitalism, you really do see what I know Ben has talked about this on the past uh, on Moderate Rebels and what I've talked about in the past in Black Agenda Report and other publications is that China's market economy is not capitalism as a whole. Capitalism does not control the economy in China. And it's very clear to see that because all of the major industries, the big industries are state owned and they are very well regulated and kept under control by the Communist Party of China. While the consumer goods industry there's a lot of private industry in that. But what I found in China very interesting was that a lot of that private industry was not necessarily foreign capital. Sure, you can go to Beijing and you can find the KFC near the Great Wall, but the majority of the businesses were Chinese. And I just wrote a piece about this actually in relation to high-speed rail, where the, um, the uh, innovation technology the Information uh, Technology Innovation Foundation, this large big tech funded uh, military industrial complex funded think tank has gone on a screed against high speed rail in China because it is state owned and because China has very strict measures in place to ensure that any private investment that is done in China is done in cooperation and in the interests of the central government and the country as a whole. So that is very clear to see, given how the booming domestic industries, especially in high tech, uh, you know, we hear about Huawei all the time, which is under sanctions by the United States and the CFO, Meng Wanzhou, is under house arrest in Canada because of the United States. We hear about how horrible it is, but one of the reasons Huawei has grown so much is because of these policies, because of the fact that all investment in China from foreign corporations, they have to go into joint ventures with a state-owned company oftentimes. Sometimes it's a private company, but the majority of times it's with a state-owned company in China, and they're able to then gain the technological know-how and implement it within the country. And that has led to this scenario, which you see when you're in China, where China's catching up, but they're doing so on their own terms. And in the next 10 years, China will be the number one economy. And in my trip, it was very clear that that will be the path. And that part of that path is going to be a rise in the standard of living for the Chinese people. And also it's going to be a more confident nation that is more assertive on the world stage, but not assertive in the way that the United States is assertive, not in a hegemonic way, right? Because the people we spoke to are not interested, they were not interested in dominating the world and being world leader in things like military bases like the United States is, uh, or war, or, you know, uh, controlling other societies. Uh, but instead, as a country that leads the way by example, through 
showing others and also learning from others about how to not only grow as an economy and grow as a country, but also how to meet these markers, these goals that a lot of which have a social uh, have a social component to them, whether it's alleviating poverty or whether it is figuring out how to both ensure that a historically poor population in 1949, the standard of living in China was 40 years old. Now it's all the way up to 77 and growing. How to both improve the standard of living of Chinese people and also create a sustainable world. That was the conversation that we had, whether it was with the Beijing Friendship Association, whether it was just talking to people on the street, what do they think of the United States? I can tell you people in China are not very high on the United States right now because of this new Cold War, because of how aggressive the Trump administration was. Now the Biden administration is picking up where Trump left off. Uh, people in China were, a lot of them were very concerned about how things were going in the United States politically. Uh, people would talk about how they associate the United States with guns and violence in the streets and how this atmosphere was creating, uh, you know, this idea that maybe the United States isn't what we thought it was because during the wild nineties there in China's development, there was a lot of cooperation, right? And then it led to the permanent uh, normalization of trade relations uh, and the most favored nation status for China in terms of U.S. investment. But those ideas or whatever misgivings uh, anyone in China had, a lot of people, uh, those voices, those neoliberal voices in China are being marginalized by folks who now understand that the United States is really only interested in domination and is all is in the final analysis hoping that China's political and economic system falls. And so that was really the trip uh, in a in a nutshell in terms of what I learned. In Xinjiang, what was very interesting was a lot of the propaganda you hear about repression and concentration camps. That's there's not even really a language there. You talk to people and they tell you we don't understand what you mean by genocide because that's not in our experience. We don't, we don't see that happening in this country. And then you start feeling like an idiot. I know Daniel Dumbrell has talked about this a lot in his recent trips there. You start feeling dumb for even asking these questions because it, it feels very foreign to the people you're talking to. Um, but what people did talk a lot about and what you could see was how life was improving. And this is just a fact, right? Over 3 million people in Xinjiang have been lifted out of poverty in the last eight or so years. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, no one died in the Xinjiang province of COVID-19. And when you walk the streets, I mean, the region itself, this Western, the most Western region of China has tens of thousands of mosques, uh, you go uh, walking in the streets of the capital. And yes, there's mosques uh, everywhere in, <laughs> in Urumqi in particular. And it's a very tourist city. So it's not as if people can't go there and walk the streets and have honest conversations. What we found is that even when the corporate media does go there, what they do is they just take snippets of images and then put their narrative around it. I know Bloomberg did this. There was a recent Bloomberg report. I think it was a March of this year where uh, reporters traveled to Xinjiang and they claimed they were being followed, right? There was just a car behind them and they claimed they were being followed. They claimed they couldn't talk to any workers. It looked like workers didn't really wanna to talk to them, right? <laughs> There's this uh, very uh, deep, atmosphere of mistrust that's being built, and rightfully so, because of the propaganda that the United States is waging on this question in particular, it's claiming that there's a genocide, claiming that there's concentration camps everywhere, and not showing any shred of evidence beyond, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, the voices of far-right Christian fundamentalists like Adrian Zenz, the folks at Axios, etc. So when I was in Xinjiang, it, even though historically it's been very poor, Arumchi, you could see how over the last 30 years, economic development has really skyrocketed there. 
all of the infrastructure was new. There were new highways in place. There was new transportation in place. High-speed rail goes directly to the region. So people, contrary to popular belief, so people in the region can travel to other parts of China. Now, many people know that in Xinjiang, for a long time after the 1949 revolution, it took hours to get to places that are traditionally, in our opinion, maybe here in the United States or in Europe, are very close to each other, right? It took a long time to travel because there was a lack of infrastructure. There was a lack of roads, bridges. There's a There was a lack of uh, automobiles, a lack of public transit in that part of the country. And uh, since especially 1990, that has changed dramatically. And, and we were able to witness it, which was a, a very amazing experience, uh, in my opinion. So that really was the trip. And it just really generated a lot of interest for me about what, what are the roots of this transformation in China? And what is the information that we need to know to counter the US's propaganda and its allies propaganda against China? Uh, because there's so much to this question of what's the reality in China, as well as what are the larger geopolitical dynamics at play which are driving the United States into this aggressive new Cold War, and which is driving um, the whole world really into what what is, I think, the question of our time, right? Which way does the world move forward from this current catastrophe that the United States is leading, this imperialist catastrophe and the environmental catastrophe that comes out of it, the endless wars that come out of it, the the just sickening poverty that we see around the world. And now we have this for more than a year, this COVID-19 pandemic, which I think has exposed so much. Coming back to the United States from this trip was probably one of the most disturbing experiences because I got to see how China's economy, how the, the central government, how its planned economy is so efficient and effective at addressing problems, addressing needs that people have and addressing the needs that the country has, you come back here and everyone's asking me if people were eating bats, right? Already there was this narrative swooning. They were asking if I had caught the virus, if I had, you know, I had actually gotten sick for a day there, right? Uh, it was like a, my immune system, I think was shot because the jet lag is ridiculous going to China from the East coast. And my coworkers were asking me, hey, you know, did, did you see people eating bats? Were people sick? Did you, you know, were you safe? Are you okay? And it's because the U.S.'s media, the U.S. media has been said, right, this propaganda machine was already turning its wheels, trying to undermine China, trying to demonize China as it was dealing with the very initial stages of the coronavirus and then what became the pandemic for the world. So, it was quite a shock. And then for the pandemic to, of course, uh, do so much damage in the United States and around the world directly after this trip, uh, just I think ha there's just a lot of lessons to that that I've been learning. And I think it really got me into wanting to investigate China more and investigate this, uh, this question of the new Cold War and uh, why we need to end it, why we need to oppose it, and why, in my opinion, we, we don't need to just oppose a new Cold War. I don't, even, I don't think that's good enough. I think we also need to be in solidarity with China and with all of the countries, right? Latin America, Africa, Asia, all of the countries that have said they prefer China's leadership in terms of you know, economic development, and it, the political principles it asserts on the world stage versus the United States, because we are seeing the U.S. becoming more and more isolated, while China has been able to develop very friendly relations with a lot of countries that most anti-imperialists in the Western world support, too, whether it's Cuba, Venezuela. Um, I can't say so much for Syria, because I think, and I know we'll talk about this later, that a lot of the same propaganda that was hurled at Syria is now being refurbished and thrown at China. But, um, you know, most of the world, especially the global South, looks to China for leadership and looks to it as a country that has a lot of lessons to be learned. Here in the United States, it's the opposite trend. We have 
public opinion dipping around China. And we have this virulent anti-communism and racism that's being produced by this new Cold War to create a large number of foot soldiers, right? A, a public that is ready to defend anti-China policies uh, whenever they are enforced. So, but I'll leave it there because I know we have a lot of questions and things to go. To. No, no, we really uh, appreciate your insight and uh, your, your experience from the ground. Uh, so yeah, thank you so, so much for that. And uh, I mean, you mentioned a couple of points that uh, really translate well into my question for Ben, so you can head to that. Um, so this, as you mentioned, like this, this narrative that's being crafted um, and has really been pushed um, over the past uh, several years, and it really plays into U.S. foreign policy, um, you know, and U.S. foreign policy, especially towards China, um, Ben has been a major part of your work at the Gray Zone, and you know, China and the U.S. is a really have a really long and contentious history. Um, so yeah, just uh, you know, thinking about history kind of being our best teacher in this uh, in this conversation. So if you could walk us through some of the recent history of the U.S. foreign policy towards China, um, thinking about the uh, the pivot to Asia under Obama, um, how that led towards the, uh, you know, the the doctrine of great power struggle, and you know, how that's kind of led in, us into the Obama administration, or sorry, the uh, the Biden administration, <laughs> basically the same thing. Oh, you're still muted, Ben. Sorry, I was muted. Can you all hear me well? Because people said my, my mic was pretty low. Yeah, you're good now. All right, cool. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the pivot to Asia under the Obama administration, because that really sets the stage for the situation we're in now. The Hillary Clinton State Department called for a pivot to Asia, which really means a pivot to war with China. When they say pivot to Asia, they called for moving a majority of U.S. military forces to the Asia-Pacific region with the specific goal of countering China, of containing China, of preventing its rise, of surrounding it with U.S. military bases. I mean, there already are dozens of U.S. military bases surrounding China, and the situation is only militarized further, and it's pretty incredible. I mean, I remember back in the Obama administration, or as it's now referred to the Obama-Biden administration, because Biden wants to take credit for it. And I say, sure, if Biden wants to take credit for the war on Libya in 2011, the war in Syria, the war in Yemen, the coup in Honduras, the coup in Brazil, cool. Let's give Biden credit for all of that as well and the Obama-Biden administration and the pivot to Asia. And so we saw the further militarization of this region. And I, I, anyway, I was saying that I remember back in the Obama administration, we, I started hearing more and more about the South China Sea, which now it's become just so boring and, and repetitive. We constantly hear members of Congress talking about the South China Sea, the South China Sea, complaining about China having its ships in the South China Sea off of the coast of China. And they claim that China supposedly is threatening U.S. military vessels that are in the South China Sea off the coast of China. And that is portrayed as some kind of natural force of nature, right? Like it's, it's totally natural and organic for the U.S. military to have military vessels surrounding China right off of its borders, surrounding Iran right off of its borders. And if an Iranian or Chinese or Russian vessel so much as get close to an American vessel that's supposedly an act of sabotage, an act of war, an act of aggression. I mean, it's in insanely hypocritical, but this goes back to the Obama administration and the Hillary Clinton State Department. And I think we should also keep in mind that this is not necessarily a new policy, of course. The U.S. has had a, a very aggressive policy with China for decades, going back to the Chinese Revolution in 1949, in which immediately after the Chinese Revolution, the United States basically had a kind of de facto war on China. We actually just have newly declassified documents showing that in the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s, the leaders of the Pentagon, the top generals who were so often told are supposedly voices of reason and the Trump administration 
the, the generals were often called the, the adults in the room. The, the media constantly called them the adults in the room. When we now go to the 1950s, the majority of Pentagon leadership, including the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the top military brass wanted a nuclear war with China. They wanted to nuke China because it had a communist revolution supported by the, the great masses of millions of Chinese against a colonial regime that had been torturing the Chinese people for over a century in what's called the century of humiliation. So the fact that the top military brass were totally on board with dropping nuclear bombs and incinerating millions of Chinese civilians right after the horrors of World War II, I think says a lot about the kind of genocidal attitude of U.S. imperialism. It's not just criminal. I mean, it really is in many ways genocidal. I and mean, this is, of course, at the time when the U.S. also kills 20 percent of North Korea's population, up to three million Koreans in the Korean War. And China was actually part of the Korean War. Calling, the, calling it the Korean War is kind of misleading. It portrays it like a, as if it were a civil war, like the Syria War. These are actually both international wars, just as the Syria war involves many players and, and the U.S. government has played a lead, a lead role in the dirty war on Syria for a decade. Similarly, the Korea war was an international imperialist war led by the United States against Korea and China came to the defense of the Korean people and hundreds of thousands of Chinese died in that war. So when we were talking about U.S. conflict with China, we should keep that in mind, that the U.S. has actually waged wars, physical wars on China. And then that brings us to the new era of war we're living in now, which you could call hybrid war, unconventional warfare, where the U.S. wages cyber attacks on China, economic attacks on China through sanctions, information warfare through media and the ridiculous narratives that we'll talk about today, these lies and fabrications that China is committing genocide, supposedly, or, you know, a panoply of ridiculous myths that the U.S. media pushes, just like weapons of mass destruction. It's the same. This is the equivalent of the WMD lie that the media laundered on behalf of the CIA to, to justify the war in Iraq. So anyway, getting back to the Obama administration, it is a kind of continuation of a through policy, but it's an acceleration of that policy. And again, I want to stress this was under the Hillary Clinton State Department. And we've seen that only intensify further. Of course, in the Donald Trump administration, Trump openly campaigned saying, China, China, China. I mean, you can find all those videos of Trump saying China 80 million times and for, and somehow like pronouncing it with three syllables. I don't, I don't really know, know how he does that, like China. But anyway... It, so Trump, he, he made that a key part of his foreign policy and, of course, imposed many rounds of sanctions on China and started the Mike Pompeo State Department, which is just the CIA. Let, let's keep that in mind that Mike Pompeo, who is a product in a Petri dish created by funding from the Koch brother oligarchs, he comes out of this astroturfed fake movement, the Tea Party and becomes, goes into Congress, and then he becomes part of the CIA. He becomes director of the CIA, Mike Pompeo, this hardcore neoconservative who just has a dying hatred of China. And after he was director of CIA, of course, he goes to the State Department. And the State Department has always had a very close relationship with CIA, but under Mike Pompeo and under the Trump administration, even the pretense of the kind of wall, supposedly, between the State Department and the CIA, that, that pretense went out of the window. I mean, they merged together. And the State Department under Pompeo and the CIA began accelerating this hybrid war. You could, I mean, it's, it's part of the new Cold War, but we should also, it's, it's a hybrid war. It's the same thing the U.S. is doing to Iran, to Venezuela. It's low intensity warfare, warfare or unconventional warfare. And the Mike Pompeo State Department also effectively declared that their goal is overthrowing the Chinese government and the Communist Party of China. And Pompeo did this in a speech that got very little media coverage. And something that I talk about a lot, and, and we try to draw attention to at the gray zone, is that oftentimes, of course, the corporate media, which it, it exists for two reasons, to serve the interests of the ruling class and the U.S. government, and the empire, the military industrial complex. So the vast majority of the media is just stenography, propaganda on behalf of the US government. 
And you can see that in many books, Michael Parenti's book on the media, and of course, uh, Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky's famous book, Manufacturing Consent. Um, but, but if you, but there's another reason, of course, which is just making money. It's the other reason. This is corporate media. It's for-profit media. And we know that the media fixates on ridiculous things like Russiagate, these ridiculous stories that get attention and clicks and views and therefore ad revenue. So they were fixated constantly on Trump and how many hundreds of hours and thousands of hours of footage did they devote to what was what was her name like? I don't know that the porn star. I don't even remember now. But like, I mean, just ridiculous, constant distractions from the actual important, important political developments that's going on in the United States. And one of those really important developments was the speech that Mike Pompeo gave at the Richard Nixon Library. And in this speech, he says that Richard Nixon's famous visit to China in 1972 and the opening of relations with China, which was a Cold War strategy to ally with China against the Soviet Union, because there had been the Sino-Soviet split. China and the Soviet Union were effectively enemies at that point. And the U.S. allied with China in order to overthrow the Soviet Union. And the Mike Pompeo State Department said that now we're in a totally new era and China is no longer an ally. China is our adversary. It's our enemy. And Mike Pompeo said explicitly at the Nixon Library that our goal is overthrowing the government led by the Communist Party of China. So, I mean, you can go read that speech. It's, it's an explicit declaration of the new Cold War. And I think we really need to, to understand that this is also a bipartisan Cold War. It was, of course, the Trump administration that took it to a new level. But now that the the Biden administration is in, they're also ex expanding this, this new Cold War. In Biden's first, well, to the extent that Biden even makes policy, of course, his mental health is clearly very low. I mean, he can't, can't even give a speech without talking about his leg hair or something. But to the extent that Biden is lucid, which, you know, it, he's not very, he gave this speech, of course, the fir his first speech to the joint session of Congress, in which Biden said, and this is an exact quote, we are in a competition with China to own the 21st century, which also just says so much about the ideology, this, this imperialist outlook of the US government. They wanna own the 21st century. What he really means is that China is the biggest threat to US unipolar hegemonic domination of the planet. After the US and its allies in Western Europe, the imperialist powers overthrew the Soviet Union and the socialist powers in the Eastern Bloc and orchestrated a series of counter revolutions and so-called color revolutions to install neoliberal puppet regimes that joined NATO and the European Union and privatized everything and sold off all their assets to Western capitalist oligarchs. China was one of the only remaining powers. And of, of course, Iran. And then also we've seen the rise of Venezuela. The Sandinista government came back to power in Nicaragua, the Cuban government. There are other examples, but China is the largest economic power in the world. And it is a massive country, the largest in the world in terms of population. And actually, it poses a threat not to the people of the United States, but to the US empire. Because since the end of the first Cold War, George H.W. Bush famously declared the New World Order. And that's not like some like weird conspiracy with like lizard people in the Illuminati. No, the New World Order, as former CIA director turned an oil baron turned U.S. President George H.W. Bush, as he said that term, he meant the U.S. empire has no competition. Washington rules the entire planet. For the first time in history of, the, of human civilization, there's one country that controls the entire planet, and it's the United States. And the rise of China has been the biggest so-called threat to that order. And that's why in his, his speech, his first speech to Congress, Biden constantly stressed China, China, China. China's our adversary. He, he says our competition. I mean, that, that's the, the liberal marketing to say enemy. The, the Republicans say enemy. The liberals say competitor. It's the same thing. And finally, this past week, there's been another major development. There was a meeting of the G7, which is ironically called the group of seven, which is supposed to be the seven largest economies in the world. But what a coincidence. It actually excludes the largest economy in the world, China, and, and includes the United States, 
and six other imperialist powers, all from Western Europe plus Japan. And this used to be referred to by anti-imperialists in the 60s and 70s, famously Samir Amin, the Egyptian anti-imperialist economist, as the Troika. And the Troika was referring to the imperialist power of the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. So the G7 is really the manifestation of imperial power led by the United States and also including the European Union and Japan. And they had a meeting in which they signed a joint declaration saying that they need to compete with China and that they're trying to create a new infrastructure project to compete with the Belt and Road Initiative launched by Beijing. So that is the ec- that's part of the economic war. G- the G7 basically declared... Under- declared an unofficial economic war on China. And then a few days later, there was a NATO meeting and NATO, the, you know, the, the Nazi arming and, tra- and training organization, you know, the North Atlantic trade, I mean, or, or treaty organization. But really, if you know anything about the history of NATO, one of the founding members was the Portuguese fascist dictatorship. And it was created by the United States as an imperial instrument to wage war on socialism and communism throughout the world. And in Operation Gladio, NATO supported fascists around the world and former Nazis. And it continues the same role today in Ukraine, supporting fascists and neo-Nazis in, like the Azov Battalion in Ukraine. And NATO at this recent meeting basically declared a military and political war on China, saying that the new reason for the NATO military alliance is to contain China. So that that brings us to today. We've seen the U.S. government under the Pompeo State Department and the Trump administration declare a new Cold War on China, saying that their explicit goal is overthrowing the Chinese government. And then, of course, they also want to privatize the one third of the economy that is run by state owned industry and balkanize China. They want to carve up Xinjiang in the West. They want to carve up Tibet. They want to carve up Hong Kong and turn it back into a British colony and divide the country up so it's weak and can never rise again. And then the G7 declared economic war against China and the Belt and Road Initiative. And then finally, NATO effectively declared military and political war on China. Yeah, thank you for that history, Ben. Uh, yeah, thank you for for taking us through that, that transition um, and really just showing that this is, you know, uh, bipartisan. Um, that you know, if if there's ever anything that the two ruling class parties in this country are in lockstep on, it is foreign policy. Um, and so you mentioned you mentioned. I mean, both of you have mentioned a few things that you know, kind of leads into this next question. And I want to uh, ask this and uh, kind of let both of you uh, you know give comments on it. Um, I mean, just the, the the term Cold War and uh, you know the many facets uh, with which the or the many pieces with which the uh, the U.S. Uh, government is uh, is moving around and trying to uh, or is utilizing to wage this new Cold War against China. Um, one of which is you know the the um, the accusations of rampant uh, human rights abuses in the Xinjiang province against the uh, the Uyghur minority there. Um, and he's been mentioned once or twice, but, uh, but Adrian Zenz uh, has been a major player uh, in the crafting of this neighborhood, or sorry, <laughs> narrative. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to, to get Danny in on this first, because uh, you had mentioned him uh, originally. Uh, if, you, if you're able to just give a little bit of history on his background, you know, where he, where he kind of came out of and how he's been presented to a Western audience. Sure. Well, Adrian Zenz is a rapture-ready evangelical, far-right Christian fundamentalist. I know Max Blumenthal, Ben Norton has done a lot of work analyzing his uh, early work on how the only way that Jews can be refined is if they go through a fiery furnace. And he has been presented, though, as a scholar, as an academic, as someone who I I think he recently actually published his first quote unquote peer reviewed piece of work, although it's still questionable whether that was actually peer reviewed by a legitimate institution. But he is someone who uh, really does carry the torch for the United States' propaganda war on Xinjiang in particular. He is given from the farthest left that we can think of, Democracy Now! hosted him in 2019 on his so-called 
research into concentration camps in Xinjiang. He has also been a forerunner of this narrative that there are forced sterilizations in Xinjiang, coming up with numbers like 80% of all new IUD insertions in China come from the province, uh, even though the real number is 8.7%. But that's neither here nor there. He is a master of statistical manipulation and really just forwarding through all sorts of different institutions he can be found in. Uh, his main employer is the Victims of Communism Foundation, although Democracy Now! and other outlets, nev they never mention this, right? Victims of Communism Foundation, even though that's a U.S. government-funded organization uh, that claims that, uh, you know, the uh, victims of World War II that uh, the Soviet Union, uh, you know, uh, you know, killed the most people during World War II. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's a very shady organization. It, it basically does propaganda work around anti communism, and is funded directly by the government. So Danny, Adrian, I hate to cut you off really quickly. I just want to add one point. The yep. Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation considers every death caused by COVID-19 in the entire world right, to, to be, be victims yeah. of communism, which right. says everything about their methodology. I mean, it's one of the most BS organizations on the planet. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly right. And, you know, it's a far right organization. I mean, it, it receives money directly from Congress to do exactly what Adrian Zenz does. And he is their most visible figure in the public sphere, in the corporate media. And he has made all of these claims. I mean, any claim you can think of, he is behind it. He has, uh, you know, he serves as um, an advisor to the New Lines Institute, which uh, has tried to come up with a similar narrative and is also uh, just a who's who in terms of its board of private intelligence contractors, of uh, pro free Syrian army and jihadist uh, forces uh, that have led this war on Syria. And, uh, you know, people who are in the Israeli lobby, uh, its president uh, is the, um, you know, used to be an advisor to AFRICOM, the US African Command. So this is sort of who Adrian Zenz is. He is someone who has, especially since uh, 2000, uh, 17. Since we started to hear about concentration camps, he has been pushed forward to the front of the corporate media as the principal quote unquote expert on everything that has to do with the US intelligence narrative around Xinjiang province. Uh, and it, it's not just him, though, because he is the most prominent individual figure, but he really does operate within a network of uh, organizations that like the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which receives start State Department funding. It receives funding directly from the Australian government. It receives funding directly from military contractors like BAE Systems, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, all of which use prison labor themselves unironically to build their components. But these are the forces that are really behind people like Adrian Zenz. They are the ones who are building up their careers and promoting this demonization campaign around Xinjiang. And what's very interesting about it is that a lot of the demonization, and this is very just true to people like Mike Pompeo and Adrian Zenz, who share, who are political brothers in a lot of ways as evangelical far right Christian fundamentalists, is that they are actually attacking progress in Xinjiang and progress uh, for China in relation to dealing with these problems. Because before 2016, we were not hearing about the so-called genocide in Xinjiang or the so-called, um, you know, concentration camp uh, story that we hear over and over and over again. And that was because for the 16 years prior to that, or 26 years prior to that, I should say, there was a lot of terrorism, a lot of violence happening in Xinjiang. Uh, hundreds upon hundreds of attacks, uh, you know, th thousands of people either injured or killed, the deadly stabbings at Arumchi in 2014. These events were happening and they were 
being led by an organization which the United States has just taken off uh, under the Trump administration has taken off of the uh, uh, you know terrorism list, which is the ETIM, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, which is now the Turkish Islamic Party, and that organization was behind many of these attacks, uh, so much so that China had to respond and it didn't do what the Soviet Union did. And this is what I think really is the reason why Adrian Zenz and this whole network of organizations have become so prominent and have become so pushed forward by the United States' propaganda machine. And it's because instead of militarily intervening in Xinjiang province and violently repressing the ETIM, what it primarily focused on was one, security. So yes, arresting the perpetrators who were committing the violence, but two, focusing on economic development, focusing on uh, the jobs situation, the underdevelopment of Xinjiang, providing people with opportunities to have a better standard of living so that they would be less inclined to join terrorist organizations because that is one of the huge problems in places like Iraq, which the United States destroyed, Afghanistan, is that the reason of one of the root causes for why these jihadist organizations, many of which the United States directly supports, uh, the ETIM is an offshoot of the Mujahideen, which the US supported in Afghanistan. Sorry, I really cut you off, Danny, but I'd love to bring Ben in on this. Yep. To see if we can get some more history on, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, the East Turkestan Islamist movement uh, now rebranded as the Turkestan Islamist Party, and uh, the World Uyghur Congress. Uh, and recently, there was a piece uh, published at the Gray Zone, um, outlining kind of the, a lot of the um, yeah some of the history and the uh, the myths around uh, this this group. And uh, so we are also coming up on on eight o'clock. So. Uh, I hate to hate to cut you off, Ben, but if you could keep the comments somewhat brief, and then we can go to a Q and A session because we got some really good questions in the uh, in the comments. But uh, but yeah, I'll let you go on this, and then we'll uh, we'll move. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll keep it pretty short. And can I share my screen? Is that okay? Yeah, you should be able to. Will are you able to uh, to make Ben a co-host? All right. Yeah, you should be good. Can do you all see the screen? Yep. Okay. Great. Well. This is this is an article. It was written by a friend of the Gray Zone contributor, Ajit Singh, great journalist, looking at the World Uyghur Congress. So we need to keep in mind, this is a U.S. government funded organization funded through the National Endowment for Democracy, which is an arm of the CIA. It was created in the 1980s under the Ronald Reagan administration. And the the co-founder, Alan Weinstein, said in an interview that what we do in the NED is what the CIA did 25 years ago. So this organization is a U.S. government funded organization. And as Ajit points out in the article, they have extensive links to right wing groups, including racist groups. And their explicit goal, as they say it, is the, quote, fall of China. And they want to overthrow the Communist Party of China. And they also want to balkanize China. And that's the goal. And I, and I want to stress this point because people wonder why there's so much propaganda about Xinjiang and about the Uyghurs. And that's not to say that the Chinese government is some perfect benevolent entity. I mean, that's like this bourgeois idealism. No country in the world is perfect. It's not saying that there's there's no Han chauvinism in China. It's not saying that there's no racism. But the idea that the Chinese government has some genocidal extermination campaign against the Uyghurs is so absurd, considering, as Danny was pointing out, that the government actually has the opposite. The, the government has a program to help modernize and develop Xinjiang, which has historically been one of the poorest regions of China, and encouraging literacy programs, education, healthcare programs, and expanding job opportunities. So what's incredible, and this relates to another article, which I have, I'm going to get up on the screen here. And this is Adrian Zenz who definitely doesn't look like a child molester. Uh, this is an article we wrote about his extremely shoddy so-called research. It's not research. I mean, what he's doing is cooking the books. And as my colleague Max Blumenthal and also the reporter Gareth Porter showed in this piece, that he straight up fabricated numbers. I mean, this is not, this is not journalism. This is not research. It's 
totally, I mean, if you, if you submitted this as an academic, you would lose your job. You, if you were a grad student, you would fail. And, but what is the point of all this, this propaganda about Xinjiang? It's to balkanize China. And where does that term balkanize come from? It comes from the, the Balkans and the, the carving up of former Yugoslavia and the Balkan region on ethno-sectarian lines. And that is exactly the goal. They want to carve off Xinjiang and create an independent state, which would be an, a right-wing Islamic state run by these U.S. government-funded right-wing secessionists. And of course, they would also be allied with U.S. imperialism and specifically Turkey. Turkey has played a key role as a NATO member in supporting the Uyghur secessionist movements in addition to Washington. And really quickly, just going through, because I know you wanted to talk about Zenz, and I'll keep this to two or three minutes here, that Zenz's research, has con so-called research, has consisted of not only cooking the books, but portraying the government's modernization and development policies in Xinjiang as something nefarious, turning what are developmental policies into dastardly, supposedly genocidal policies. So for instance, there is a program of family planning and everyone who knows the basics about China knows that they had the one child policy, the two child policy. Now they're expanding that further. But what's, what's not what widely known is that ethnic minorities who are not part of the Han majority were actually exempted from the one child policy. That very genocidal, obviously. China's trying to encourage ethnic minorities to have more children, which sounds genocidal to me. No, I mean, it's obviously absurd. And they, the Chinese government also has a strong family planning policy. And in what's incredible is you look at through this so-called research of Zen's, and he shows, he portrays these, these policies to try to help develop and fight poverty in the region of Xinjiang as if it were nefarious. And also talks, this article talks about cherry picking and distorting the material. So here's an example. Here are some photos of elderly Uyghur Muslims in China getting health care, free health care provided by the government. And Adrian Zenz takes this photo and portrays as an example of forced sterilization as if the Chinese government is forcibly sterilizing old women who likely can't even have children. What? That doesn't make sense. I mean, it's it's totally fraudulent. He's taking photos out of context of the government providing free health care to Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And then there's also the incredible lie that Danny mentioned, where he takes these numbers on IUDs, former birth control, and claims he totally fakes the numbers and claims that there were 1,600 IUDs inserted per female in in Xinjiang per Uy Uyghur female per year. That, that is insane. That means there will be multiple IUD insertions and removals every single day for every single woman. So this guy, I mean, even aside from the fact that, as Danny mentioned, he has this book, Worthy to Escape, Why All Believers Will Not Be Raptured Before the Tribulation. I mean, gr great, great catchy title, right? I mean, even ignoring the fact that this guy is a far-right Christian fanatic who has said that he's led by God against China, even looking at it objectively from a scientific perspective, it is totally fraudulent fake research. So, I mean, that's why it's so important to hit these points. But again, finally, the point I want to reiterate, why is there so much propaganda? It's the same reason that there was a huge propaganda campaign of people, remember when I was a kid, over Tibet. I remember like Richard Gere and all of these Hollywood stars, like they were making all these insane anti-China propaganda movies about Tibet. And they were all supporting the Dalai Lama, not mentioning of the that the Tibetan Buddhist leadership, I'm not saying the religion, but I'm saying the political leadership of the political movement led by the Dalai Lama has collaborated extensively with the CIA for decades. This is public knowledge. There are declassified documents showing that the Tibetan the Tibetan Buddhist leadership, the secessionist movement led by the Dalai Lama is funded by the CIA, that the CIA after the triumph of the Chinese revolution created guerrilla armies like the Contra death squads in Nicaragua to wage a guerrilla war, a terrorist war against the central Chinese government to create an independent Tibet. And who would be the leader? It would be the monarchical unelected leadership of the Dalai Lama. And by the way, before Tibet became part of China, slavery was de facto still legalized. It was de facto still very common. And feudalism was still very common. 
across Tibet. So it's the same strategy today. Just as, you know, I remember in the 90s, there were like all these concerts with like the Beastie Boys and stuff to raise money. And it was organized by these student groups who were astroturfed with US government funding to create a, an artificial astroturf student movement calling for secession in Tibet. And today they're doing the same thing against Xinjiang. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, and yeah, thank you, Danny, for that as well. Um, and uh, as I said, we're going to uh, kind of switch gears a little bit here uh, and go into a Q&A uh, portion of this. And uh, I wanted to open this up and um, um, let's start with, uh, with Danny. Sorry, I'm trying to pull the other uh, question up here. Um, doo -doo -doo. OK, here we are. Um, yeah, if, uh, Danny, if you could comment on, um, uh, the, the rise of, I mean, it kind of the, the, the repopularization, if you will, of the, um, the lab theory, the lab creation theory of COVID-19, um, originally the, it kind of smeared as well, uh, presented as this, this extremely racist lie, which it is under the, uh, the, um, Trump administration by the Democrats, and now it's been you know, re, re uh, kind of resurrected um, by them. So, if you could uh, comment on that and uh, kind of how and uh, and why that's been done. Wow. Well, that's a big question. You know, I, I, there's a lot of confusion about this right now, and a lot, I think a lot of the confusion stems from the fact that now Joe Biden is on board with the lab leak theory and. This came after a co-authored piece in the Wall Street Journal, Journal, Michael R. Gordon, who, you know, in 2002 was spreading weapons of mass destruction lies about Iraq in mainstream media. I believe it was the New York Times. He published, he co-authored a report. I think it was three authors of that report, which said that scientists in this lab uh, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, not as John Stewart said, the coronavirus lab. Uh, that is actually not in the name of the lab. But there was evidence presented, of course, from un, in, you know, anonymous, unnamed intelligence uh, operatives who claimed that this illness from these scientists, I think it was around November of 2019, proves that there could be a smoking gun here, that COVID-19 could come from a lab. And then you had Joe Biden come out in recent weeks and say he wants a 90-day review from the U.S. intelligence apparatus to show him whether there's any, uh, whether there is any validation to this claim. And this isn't new. I mean, during the campaign, on the campaign trail, as Donald Trump was spreading the lab leak uh, theory uh, uh, around this conspiracy. Joe Biden was saying something similar to the effect that, okay, well, it might not be that we know this. We should have had inspectors there. We should send. We should have sent our folks, our experts, into China to make sure they were doing the right thing. So there's always been this tacit endorsement of this, and. It is really a part of this new Cold War. And, and there are so many elements to it that are very important that just show shows how egregious it is. And a lot of people on the left have now come to believe that because of their hatred of Fauci, right? Fauci lied to all of us about masks because he wanted to protect the completely uh, unprepared character of the U.S. economy to address the pandemic. There was not enough PPE. So he told us in February, don't wear masks, right? Uh, we didn't need to wear masks to prevent the spread of the pandemic unless we were sick. And ever since then, there's been a lot of distrust around Fauci, rightfully so. But now because of associate, his association with this lab, a very small one, albeit, I mean, this is a lab the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which has partnerships with Canada, France, the United States, uh, and China to uh, figure out how to address pandemics. And also, it's a whole Institute of Virology. It's not just about coronaviruses. But the point is, is that really what we have here is an evidence-free claim 
right? I, I compared it in my article to Russiagate in so far as what it does is it presents China as a national security threat because as Donald Trump said over and over and over again on his campaign, China created this virus and then spread it around the world. It's the quote unquote China virus. And the lab leak theory is the most sophisticated way of communicating this uh, skepticism and this demonization of China. You know, last year, right, around this time, there were articles being written. I know that I know Ajit Singh co-authored one with Max Blumenthal of April of last year, fairness and accuracy, uh, reporting and accuracy and reporting fair. They also published a whole analysis about why this is isn't something that we should go down the rabbit hole with. I mean, we have evidence, right, that the sources being used around this from very early on, whether we're talking about now with the intelligence, uh, un, you know, anonymous intelligence sources, or whether we're talking about uh, any defunded far right activist, Xiao Chang, who, you know, um, was spreading this lie um, last year, whether it's the 2018 State Department cable, which really was a nothing burger, it didn't have any concerns about safety or any issues in the report. Or they were talking about Tucker Carlson, who had on uh, Yan Li Meng, who is a discredited former Hong Kong University um, so-called researcher who has connections to Steve Bannon and Guo Wang Yi, the billionaire uh, who, uh, together with Steve Bannon, was directing the Hong Kong protests and the far-right activists uh, in the so-called quote-unquote pro-democracy movement, which found bipartisan support, especially in 2019. So I think. That's the point is that this is a uh, this is a anonymous claim from intelligence sources and we need to question it and we also need to understand that the origins of pandemics it's going to take a long time to figure this out and this only undermines the World Health Organization and it undermines all countries around the world everyone from being able to understand this pandemic better and to really address it it's a whole distraction from that very question how do we get rid of this thing we can't do that if we are looking to blame China, the country that most effectively handled this pandemic for the spread as being somehow the quote unquote sick man of Asia and giving us all a disease. It's a racist stereotype and it's just a very sophisticated way of trying to build skepticism um, around China and around uh, the COVID-19 virus as a whole. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Uh, so, and Pivoting back to, to Ben here, there were a couple of things that were mentioned and uh, in Danny's comments and also just from questions in the chat. Um, speaking about like the, the uh, perceived and uh, the presented aggression of the Chinese government, um, uh, there's a question in the chat asking about uh, the Chinese government's handling of the Hong Kong protests, uh, you know, were they, they brutally repressed and also, uh, the presentation that has been um, and uh, taken in uh, to a large extent by the left of China being, you know, an imperialist power, um, and just wondering if you could you could comment on that um, specifically, thinking about the uh, the Hong Kong protests, and then uh, um, I know there's been a couple uh, accusations of uh, China's use and uh, funding of projects in Africa and Central America. Absolutely. Well, going back to Hong Kong, again, I, I, I mean, I just because I want to keep some of these answers short, because I know there's a lot of questions. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly for people who want to read more. We've published a lot on, on the Hong Kong coup attempt. I mean, it was a coup attempt. It was a classic what, what's called color revolution. After the overthrow of the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc, the U.S. government through the CIA and its arms like the NED and USAID, supported a series of coups, soft coups to overthrow governments that had still social democratic policies and state ownership and installed neoliberal puppet regimes that joined NATO and the European Union and privatized everything to Western capital. And that was what they were trying to do in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, of course, had been a British colony, which is almost never discussed, but until very recently, until many of our lifetimes. 
It was a British colony. And as part of the negotiations with the British government, China agreed to one country, two systems to allow Hong Kong to have this kind of neoliberal system. And the, they, the Western imperialist powers were not satisfied with that. They wanted Hong Kong to be independent, to secede and be like a new Taiwan, which would be a thorn in the side of Beijing. And if you look at the leadership of the Hong Kong secessionist movement, which was extremely violent, you see, as you see in this image, they were holding up banners like President Trump, please liberate Hong Kong with American flags. And they were extremely violent, attacking reporters. As you can see, there's videos here. There were many who were using far right symbols like Pepe the Frog, which is obviously you know, a, a symbol to far right forces in, in the West. And Jimmy Lai is one of the main figures who was supporting a lot of this. He was funding it. Jimmy Lai has been referred to as the Rupert Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch of Asia. He is a billionaire media oligarch. And Jimmy Lai met with John Bolton. He met with, with Mike Pence. He met with leaders of the U.S. government. And in his media outlet, Apple Daily, which was really fueling the propaganda that helped push the Hong Kong riots and secessionist movement. He published racist attacks on mainland Chinese, portraying them as locusts who are overtaking Hong Kong. And the reason that is, is because if you know recent Chinese history, mainland Chinese before tended to be poor and Hong Kong tended to be a very rich region because it was embedded with Western capital. It was a British colony. So they were portraying the mainland Chinese as locusts, as the poor people from China as locusts. And we have other articles showing how other, like the young leaderships of the Hong Kong secessionist movement, you can see here meeting with Nancy Pelosi, they were also deeply working closely with the US government, funded by the US government to support US government interests as they explicitly said. So there are, there are many examples of this. I'm trying, this thing is annoying at the top of Zoom. Also another article we looked at I mean, all this stuff is extremely thoroughly documented. I wrote this article about how Ukrainian Nazis, also backed by the U.S. government, went to the U the Hong Kong secessionist riots to participate. And you can see in this photo here, there are four Ukrainian Nazis who participated in the white supremacist militia, the Azov Battalion, which it has been funded or which other has been armed and trained by the U.S. military. And then finally, we have another article here, and you can see again, once again. These are some of the leaders of the, this is one of the main leaders of the Hong Kong secessionist movement. And what the U.S. does in these so-called color revolution attempts is it cultivates especially young leaders, uh, particularly student leaders, and uses them, it trains them through NGOs that are funded by the NED and USAID. It trains them in media. They, they appear all over Western media. It's the same thing that the U.S. does internally with people like DeRay McKesson. They find these, all, these, these mercenaries, these neoliberal people who have really no economic and political ideology. They're just mercenaries who, who want to be famous, and they cultivate them through NGOs, and they put, they put them all over the media, and then they appoint them the so-called leaders of a movement, even though they were never... Uh, they were never elected leaders of anything. And then what they do is, in terms of foreign so-called leaders, they come to the United States, they meet with people like Marco Rubio and the, the most hardcore right-wing figures in the U.S. political the U.S. political class. So, you know, th that's that's what we're talking about with Hong Kong. And that's not to say that everyone who participated is a U.S. government-funded, you know, agent. Of course not. You know, there were large protests, although polling consistently showed, even polling by Reuters, which is which is funded by the British government and very close to the British government, British intelligence. Even Reuters acknowledged that polling showed that a majority of people in Hong Kong supported their relationship with the central Chinese government and wanted to remain part of China. That isn't to say that, that there aren't legitimate grievances. And many of those grievances, ironically, are due to the neoliberal system that the British government forced Hong Kong to have as part of the one country, two systems. 
So yes, there were protests against, for instance, rising rent rates. Rent is very expensive in Hong Kong. There are inequality issues in Hong Kong. And ironically, those economic issues are much worse in Hong Kong, which has the neoliberal system, as opposed to mainland China, which has its own market socialist system. So ironically, many of the young people who participated were duped into the protest, just as we were seeing with Belarus right now, as we saw in Ukraine in 2014. They're being duped with propaganda into participating in these protests that are being led and, and also are very violent by Western government funded organizations. I mean, we've documented it very thoroughly. It's not a matter of opinion that the so-called leadership of these movements are funded by Western governments. It's an objective fact. Whether or not you want to acknowledge that, I mean, that's that's up to you. But it's unfortunate because a lot of these narratives are very effective of young people rising up against a dictatorial regime. But it's a classic strategy going back to Gene Sharp, this U.S. government funded figure who worked closely with the CIA, who created a blueprint for what people refer to as color revolutions, or what you could also refer to as Hugo Chavez in Venezuela referred to as soft coups. That, that's what the U.S. is doing, soft coup d'etats. Instead of using a military, they use unconventional warfare through information warfare, economic warfare, and these kind of violent secessionist riots to destabilize the government. And finally, the last thing I'll add is that one of the U.S. government-backed so-called leaders of the Hong Kong secessionist movement wrote an, an op-ed in the New York Times, and he said that the point is to get the police to attack you. That was the official goal in Hong Kong. And ironically, if you look at what happened in the United States with the massive uprising last year, there the police killed dozens of protesters. And every year in the United States, police kill over a thousand people. But in Hong Kong, how many people were killed by police? Zero. Zero deaths at the hands of police, even though as this person acknowledged, as leader of the riot movement acknowledged in the New York Times, their goal, which is the goal trained by the U.S. government and Gene Sharp, the master of the color revolution, is you want to encourage violence by the state. And then there's a million cameras around filming everything. So you use violence against the police and the state security forces to force them to commit violence against you. And then you film it as so-called evidence of the repressive violent regime. Yeah, thank you for that, Ben. And uh, so I'm going to uh, jump to Danny here and uh, have one last question for, for both of you, because uh, we are coming up on the 830 mark. Um, yeah, it's been it's been asked a couple of times, just what you think uh, is is a good way, best way that we here in the U.S., you know, we, you know, here, you know children of empire, pure people in the other heart of global imperialism, uh, what can we be doing to counter uh, this, you know, new Cold War, the narrative, uh, you know, the march towards the hot war uh, in, in our organizing and in our daily lives? Uh, so we'll start with you, Danny, and then uh, end with Ben. All right, another big question. I will try to be brief with this one. Um, well, I think the tradition of internationalism within the larger mass movement in the United States and the West has been, for the most part, lost. And, and I think that sped up, that really intensified after the fall of the Soviet Union. The United States and the West, uh, even though there have been wonderful and heroic liberation movement traditions, Black America, Indigenous people, as well as valiant and heroic working class struggles, because of the position of the United States and the West as empires, as imperial, the epicenters of imperialism, these movements have always required that the, the, those on the periphery, those in the global South, lead the way in terms of a vision for what internationalism would re really looks like, right? And so, I think what we need to do here in the United States, especially where I am, is, and, and it's very related to the West because in a lot of ways, the West from Australia to the UK, France, et cetera, they're all junior partners of the United States at this point. They're all vassals of NATO. They're all vassals of the EU. In the EU and the United States uh, work hand in foot. Uh, and oftentimes 
with their policy towards China hurt themselves because they are so under the thumb of the United States that they are willing to destroy their largest trading partner or relations with their largest trading partner just to curry favor with the U.S. ruling class. And so at this point, what's needed is a rekindling of what internationalism really means. And first and foremost, because I don't know if right now we're sophisticated enough to understand the overall geopolitical situation where China is actually leading a multipolar world and leading a model for economic and political development, which is far superior to the needs of humanity than the United States. But first and foremost, before we can even get to that kind of understanding as a movement and as uh, an anti-imperialist movement, we need to be able to stand up to the aggression that's right in front of our faces, the 400 military bases that the United States has surrounding China, as Ben said, uh, the aggression that the United States wages in the South China Sea, uh, the fact that there are sanctions right now on China in so many different areas, whether it's diplomatic around the Communist Party of China, or whether we're talking about the tech industry and there's a real effort to isolate other countries around the world. We don't talk about this enough, is that sanctions on countries around the world like Myanmar and uh, Venezuela, uh, except Nicaragua, a lot of that is to prevent those countries from being able to uh, deal on the global market and to be able to develop on their own terms similar to China and as well as prevent China, give China a reason to think twice about dealing with these countries. And luckily, China does not listen. China does not think sanctions are a legitimate form of political governance. And so oftentimes this backfires. So we see the growing China-Russia relationship and we see the global South and China coming together. And we need to understand why. And the reason why is because right where we sit, the United States in the Western world is the real enemy. It is the enemy to a common uh, uh, vision for human progress in the world on all fronts, economic, political, environmental, whatever we're talking about. And that's where we need to take our focus around China is to respect China's sovereignty, respect its self-determination and forward a vision and demands for real true cooperation around things like pandemics, war, peace, environment, et cetera. That's where we need to begin. And then as Ben and myself and others we're trying to debunk all of the lies that prevent us from doing that. And we need to do that work too, because it's so very important. Yeah, thank you so much, Danny. Um, yeah, Ben, same, uh, same question to you. What do you think the, uh, the ways for, for us here in the West to, uh, to be countering these uh, would be? Great, well, thanks for having me. Uh, just concluding here, I just wanna throw in a few things. I'll, I'll briefly answer that question as well. I also wanna acknowledge, there's a really good comment from Sorry if I mispronounce your name. I believe it's Jesse Oslavsky in the comments. Jesse wrote, I teach at a university near Shanghai, China. Many of my students are minorities, including a number of Chinese Muslims. All of the minority students are recipients of free tuition, priority access to university, tax exemptions, and priority access to state jobs. China has the largest system of affirmative action in the world. And then Jesse had the same question. How do we convince leftists in the West to stop believing this Cold War propaganda. I mean, I think what we're doing right now is part of it. We have to we have to build a movement. I mean, one of the main contradictions in the Western left for decades has been exactly this contradiction, supporting or being soft on imperialism and not recognizing that imperialism is not just something that is on a it's on like a laundry list of issues. It is a key central contradiction. If you're if you're a socialist, or progressive in the heart of empire, you can't just redistribute wealth that's stolen from the global south to your fellow citizens. I mean, that's that's pure chauvinism. You have to end the exploitation in the global south as well. And it's not just through sweatshops. It's not just through wars and military occupation. It's also through sanctions. We need to talk much more about ending sanctions, organizing and sanctions. And there are many other things. So I think it's part of growing an anti-imperialist movement and an anti-war movement. And then another key way is to challenge these lies, these myths, because you know it's incredible as people, most Americans know of the WMD's lie. They many have heard of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, another lie the US used to justify the genocidal war in Vietnam that killed 3 million Vietnamese. Or 
the lie used to justify the Gulf War in which the U.S. claimed that the Iraqi government was was taking Kuwaiti babies out of incubators. And this young girl named Naira, who was this 15-year-old who was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador, was trained by several PR firms in Washington to how to lie. And she gave this speech crying on the Cong congressional floor, claiming that she saw Iraqi soldiers take Kuwaiti babies out of incubators. A total lie. So that's exactly, they're doing the same tactics against China today, just as they're doing the same tactics against Nicaragua right now, with the election coming up in November, against Venezuela, claiming that Venezuela's trafficking drugs, which is absurd. What, meanwhile, next door, the Colombian regime is a narco regime, and the far-right president, Ivan Duque, stole the election using drug money. But one, one of those lies, you know, today we talked about many of those lies in, re in regard to China and how to dispel those lies. And really quickly, I mean, I mentioned this article in the New York Times. I just want people to see it. This is the headline in the New York Times. A Hong Kong protester's tactic, get the police to hit you, using aggressive nonviolence to provoke the authorities and win over the public. And they say, an important idea has been circulating. It's called marginal violence theory, and it holds that protesters should use the most aggressive so-called nonviolent actions possible to push the police and the government to their limits. I mean, these are the things, this is what the U.S. government is teaching these secessionists and what to do. I mean, they say they say nonviolence. It's actually not. It is violence. They're just, it's not lethal violence. And another lie that we've heard a lot about is this question. I, I, sorry, I forgot to answer, but I'll briefly answer in one minute here. And that's the idea of Chinese debt bondage, which is yet another example of insane projection on behalf of Western capital and the U.S. government, which has trapped dozens of countries in the global south in debt through the IMF and the World Bank, some of the most destructive, violent institutions in the world that have destroyed local food systems in countries like Haiti, making poor Haitians, making them re reliant on dependent on U.S. Ford food exports. I mean, how many people have died because of this? Hundreds of thousands have starved to death and died because they can't get medicine. And meanwhile, they're accusing China of what the U.S. is doing through the IMF and the World Bank. Meanwhile, if you even read communist propaganda like the Financial Times, I mean, a neoliberal mouthpiece of the British ruling class, I mean, it's the British equivalent of the Wall Street Journal. Even they have acknowledged reluctantly that China has renegotiated a huge part, a huge percentage of its loans, and especially to so-called developing countries in the global south. And this is the FT, the voice of the British capitalist class, saying explicitly that this research challenges, challenges debt trap accusations surrounding Chinese lending. They, they looked at 24 countries and 38 Chinese debt renegotiations. And if you look here, they also they say debt forgiveness is often motivated by a desire to improve bilateral relations. Also in cases of acute financial distress, China wrote off, for instance, all, for nearly 400 million of Cuban debt. And the Cuban government, the socialist government of Cuba, has referred to China as one of its great allies. Fidel Castro said China has helped give the global south hope for the future. Also renegotiating Zimbabwean loans. Well, the U.S. and European Union suffocate Zimbabwe with illegal sanctions, and which is economic warfare. Also Angola, the Maldives. And it says that the rene renegotiations account for a significant chunk of Chinese sovereign lending. And if you look here, John Hopkins University, which is very closely linked to the U.S. government and U.S. intelligence, but even they, in their research, they have had to acknowledge that the whole the debt trap myth is pure projection. I mean, it's not to say that China does all of this out of its good, you know, the goodwill of its heart. I mean, China certainly has its own economic and political motives, and a lot of that is is part of its attempt to create. What, what it calls a system of South-South integration. And this gets to Africa. Polls, shows, polls show that a majority of people in various, Af various African countries who have development programs with China support the programs because they're development programs. China understands that in order to do trade, in order to, to rebuild the Silk Road, it has to develop infrastructure in these regions of the world where there is not advanced infrastructure because they've been de-developed through 
American and European colonization and neocolonialism. So over hundreds of years of European colonization of Africa, why is there not advanced infrastructure? And, and in South Asia, why did they not develop infrastructure? Because the only infrastructure these colonial powers developed was the roads to the ports to export the commodities and the, and the natural resources and raw materials from Africa. They didn't actually develop the infrastructure within African nations. China is doing that as part of the Belt Road Initiative. And yes, it's doing that so it can do business with these countries. But doing business with a country is not imperialism. Every country in the world does commerce outside of its borders. I mean, even the, the smallest, poorest countries, they don't produce everything domestically. They're not totally self-sufficient. They have to do trade and commerce with other countries. That's not imperialism. Trade is not imperialism. So there's so much misinformation. And finally, the, the thing I'll say here is that we have to be able to dispel that propaganda. I think that's one of the most important things we can do to develop this anti-imperialist movement. It's why I'm a journalist. And the same propaganda we hear against China, is in, it's been recycled again and again. It's very similar to the propaganda against the former Soviet Union, against Iran, against Venezuela, against Nicaragua. And I think as a journalist, it's you know my responsibility and I'm trying to do it and Danny's trying to do it to show those lies. And hopefully today, you know, this was a good introduction, a, a crash course into the kind of basics of the propaganda behind the new Cold War. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, uh, both of you, um, for for all of this. I know I learned a, a huge amount, and I hope uh, everybody else, uh, everybody attending, did as well. Thank you so much for uh, um, for spending uh, this time with us. And just uh, real quickly before we wrap up, um, Daniel, let's start with you. If you could just uh, let us know where we can uh, we can find your work and uh, where we can follow you. Sure. So you can find my work uh, almost weekly, if not weekly, at blackagendareport.com. You can also find me on CGTN. I'm an opinions contributor there. You can find I'm a co-editor of a new project, Friends of Socialist China. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook. And I am also on Twitter at Spirit of HO, a Spirit of Ho. And you can follow me there and you can subscribe to my Patreon at patreon.com slash Danny Haifang. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone, anyway, for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we really appreciate you coming out. Thank you so much for your insights. And uh, yeah, back to you, Ben. Yeah, well, you can find me at The Gray Zone. That is thegrayzone.com. Gray with an A, as you can see behind the, the Yankee spelling. And in terms of where you can follow me personally, I was actually going to get this image up earlier. This is my Twitter account at Benjamin Norton. And the last thing I'll say before we conclude is whenever you hear all this propaganda in the media about how China is supposedly a threat, China, 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 and the South China Sea, these are the known U.S. military bases surrounding China, just the ones that are known. So we have to ask, well, yeah, China's such a threat. Why, why did it surround itself with so many U.S. military bases? Come on, like such a threat. No, I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd. So don't believe this Cold War propaganda. If you want to learn more about what's going on, not just in China, but around the world, especially in Latin America, where I live and report from, you can go to thegrayzone.com and shout out to all the groups organizing this. Thank you so much. Uh, New Hampshire Peace Action, and of course, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, PSL, which is one of the most important organizations in the United States, organizing every single day. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much.